where do we tend to see keratosis pilaris? Far and away, the number one location that we'll see it is the back of the arm. And then sometimes it will also kind of creep around onto the front of the arm. That's like over 90% of people are gonna get it in those areas. It can also be like on the top of the thighs, top and side of the thighs. That's uh, the next most common, maybe around 60%. And kind of that the buttocks area, about 30%. You can get it in other places, but it's a lot less likely. What I think is interesting is that different areas of the body have different kind of... Dr. Greenberg, I am so excited to have you back to the show. You're like one of the favorite guests. So I really appreciate you coming back because we have so much to talk about with keratosis pilaris. It's a topic I've only covered once. And to be entirely honest with you, it's not really my wheelhouse. I feel like there's so much we don't know. So thank you so much for joining us to talk about it today. Well, thank you so much for having me. You know, I love being here and I actually listen to every single episode of the podcast. So thanks for having me. You're welcome. So let's talk about what exactly keratosis pilaris or KP is. My experience with it, I briefly had it earlier in life, was like this really rough, dry, almost like chicken skin on the back of my arms. And um, I it just like kind of bothered me a little bit, but not enough that I did anything about it. But I have heard from countless listeners that they find it to be really problematic and they don't tend to, I don't know, it's like nobody cares about it in a sense. So let's talk about what exactly it is and why you think maybe no one is doing anything. I mean, like you had shared with me before, there's not much even research on this topic. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think, and you're right that our patients and clients care a lot about the KP, but the medical community doesn't. They kind of consider it a cosmetic problem. And a lot of times patients are just dismissed by their doctors or dermatologists like, oh, don't worry about it you know, just ignore it. Or, um, you know, maybe they're given something to try to scrub the bumps down. Um, but it really affects a lot of people and they feel self-conscious about it. Um, it can itch, it can be dry. And like you said, the, the colloquial or common term, term is chicken skin. Cause if you think about a plucked kind of chicken skin look, that is what it can kind of look like. But there's often these little bumps. There's kind of two physical presentations. One is kind of like white bumps. And then the other is more kind of like red bumps or even flat scabs. And then it can be on what we call an erythematous base, which is that the skin underneath is kind of red. So any of those presentations. And what's actually going on and medically is a term called follicular hyperkeratosis. So let's break that down. Follicular, it's the follicle. So all of this is happening within the hair follicle. So you can't get keratosis pilaris if you're not dealing in a place with a hair follicle. Now we have hair follicles on almost all of the body. We don't unlike the palms of our hands or soles of our feet. So you wouldn't be able to get KP there. Um, we'll talk about where KP usually shows up, but what's happening is down in the follicle, so we have millions of hairs on our body and there's two types of hairs. There's terminal hairs, which are these hairs on our head or after puberty hairs in the armpits on the face of uh, you know, males or in the genitals. Those are big, thick hairs. And then there's these teeny tiny vellus hairs, like even, you know, um, for those of you on video, you know, my arm hair, I mean, you can't really see it, just those little teeny tiny blonde fuzzies. Um, but even those hairs, right, we, we don't really think about, well, how does the hair get out? If we think about the skin, the hair follicle is, of course, underneath the skin, and the hair starts growing below the surface of the skin. That hair is gonna kind of travel up through the hair shaft, all tumbling up under the skin, and at some point, it needs to poke up and through the skin and come out. So again, if you're looking at your arm and you see little fuzzies, or even if you feel your face, we've all got hair in our face, Again, you know, males will have after puberty terminal, but women, we've got these little vellus hairs and they need to poke up and out and come out cleanly. In keratosis pilaris, there's a problem with that process. It's not be, being able to tunnel up and out and then poke through the skin cleanly. And so we get a condition called 
uh, follicular plugging. And instead of it being able to poke cleanly up and out through the skin and just see where you can see the hair, it kind of gets trapped and plugged and it can create a keratin plug. So keratin is a protein in the skin and that creates that kind of white bump. And I'm gonna give an image that you're gonna put into the video. So if you guys are listening to this and you wanna see an image of follicular plugging, you can go to the video. Uh, but that white bump is the keratin plug. It's not like acne or a zit. It's not something where you can kind of just pop it. You, you would need to almost insert like a needle and I'm not recommending people do this, but it's not like poppable. Um, and what's happening is that the skin cells that are the corneocytes, which are a type of uh, skin cell, are lining the hair shaft and that top outer layer. And normally when the hair grows up and out of the follicle and pokes through the skin, those corneocytes are very cleanly getting out of the way of the hair as it grows up through the shaft and it pokes out of the skin. There's no inflammation, there's no process, right? We have 5 million ha hairs on our body. This is the way it's supposed to happen. We're not supposed to be inflamed when we get a new hair. But with keratosis pilaris, something is going on. We get these kind of gummed up corneocytes that tend to get dragged by the hair as it comes up and out of the follicle and can even gum up the surface so that the hair can't poke cleanly through. That's where we get that white bump or the red bump and we can get the redness on the skin. It's an inflamed response. This is not a normal process for how the hair comes up and out. And so that's follicular plugging and um, that term, you know, that I said at the beginning, follicular hyperkeratosis is too much kerat keratin basically in the follicle. And it's just basically an abnormal way that that hair is coming up and out because there's problems with the skin around the hair. This episode is brought to you by my line of professional grade supplements called NutraQuel. I crafted these supplements, especially for those struggling with chronic skin rash issues, and based the formulations on my extensive research and clinical experience in my private practice. They are made from the highest quality ingredients and tested to be free of different allergens so that you can support your gut, liver, and overall health with the formulas that I found work best for my skin rash warrior clients without triggering a flare. I'm excited to share them with you, so check them out at quellshop.com and use the coupon code GET15OFF to get 15% off your first order. I'll put a link in the description below. And now let's jump back to the video. And so how many people does this impact and generally who? Because it seems to be, at least from my experience, fairly common, but I, I don't know. What, what do the stats say? Yeah, it's, it's actually super common. And it's shocking to me when we look at how common it is versus how little research there is. So the numbers vary. Um, you know, my youngest patient, I think I've had a nine month old with very severe uh, keratosis pilaris or KP as you called it. But the kind of average onset is maybe around age nine or like puberty, that's kind of where the peak uh, onset is. Um, so it often begins in childhood, but anywhere from it's estimated 50 to 80% of adolescents and up to 40% of adults worldwide suffer from some amount of keratosis pilaris. It is very, very common. But yet, because it's considered just a cosmetic and not real medicine, it doesn't get the attention of dermatology research, you know, or research dollars. And we have a, there's a database called PubMed where doctors and clinicians go to find uh, research. That's where research is published. If you do a search, for example, on psoriasis, you're going to get over 58,000 studies and research projects that have been done trying to figure out different aspects of psoriasis. If you go to that same data, data, database and type in keratosis pilaris, you're going to get about 380. It's not a lot, especially when you look at up to 40% of adults have it. It's just completely dismissed by most doctors as like, oh yeah, just don't worry about that. Or here, take this steroid or just kind of scrub it off, slough it off. But I think it's much more than that. I, I think it's, it's indicative of an underlying problem and that we shouldn't just dismiss it as a cosmetic issue. And 
as we've talked about, it really bothers people. Uh, people feel like they can't wear shorts or tank tops in the summer. Uh, they're embarrassed. It's itchy. It's bothersome. And um, I do think it's indicative of an underlying um, dysfunction, basically. Yeah. So when I was in uh, grad school, the thing that was taught to us was that, well, it could be a sign of gluten sensitivity. It could be a sign of poor um, fatty acids from like vitamins and other nutrients in your system. So you're not absorbing them well. But beyond that, there was no real explanation. So it was looked at as like maybe a clinical sign. I guess a lot of time, mostly we were probably looking at it for gluten and uh, possibly like low like, oh, we should probably t get labs run for like vitamin D, et cetera, vitamin A, et cetera. But um, beyond that, there, there has never really been much explanation as to what could be causing this. Is there, is there a gut component? Is there a diet component? Like how broadly should we consider this from a more like root cause perspective? Yes, these are all great questions. The unfortunate answer is that, you know, even from back when you learned about it, there's still, if you try to look up what causes keratosis pilaris, the, the answer is unknown. Um, you know, so the real answer is that we still don't really know what causes it, but there are a list of potential things and I do treat it. And I actually really like treating it because I tend to get good results. Now, um, if anyone has heard me spoke on your, uh, speak on your podcast before, they'll know that my kind of methodology is I do treat only chronic dermatological complaints, which KP is, and I do that a lot by addressing what's going on in the gut. So even for my KP patients, I will still do the same thing. I do a stool test and I do a urine test called an oat organic acid test. The reason I'm doing that is I'm trying to assess the gut microbiome and see what's going on in the gut of my patients. Um, and by correcting that gut dysbiosis, I do see a lot of benefits um, happening on the skin, even with KP. There are uh, numerous other things that I found in the literature that I've gone after that I find helpful as well. But I definitely start with testing and treating the gut. And to your point um, with you know some food sensitivities, um, I definitely, I have a patient with eczema and keratosis pilaris, and we'll talk about the connection. Uh, for that child, he was about seven. Um, really cutting out dairy was the key piece. And that really almost like, it was just that simple. You know, for most people, it's not going to be that simple. Just like with eczema, most of the time, it's not just that simple finding like the one food, but sometimes it can. So I do think there is a food sensitivity issue. Dairy and gluten are my two big that I try cutting out with KP. Um, but as you mentioned, there's, I think, issues with fatty acid uh, deficiencies. There can be vitamin deficiencies. Um, there can be issues with hormones, inflammation, uh, a gene mutation called filaggrin that I've talked about and I know many people have talked about on your podcast and also something happening within a hair follicle. We have these sebum or sebaceous glands. There seems to be a lack of them in the keratosis pilaris follicle. So we can talk about any of those things that you want. I know we can go down so many different roads here. So Let's talk a little bit about the sebaceous gland piece of this, because I think it speaks to maybe some of how this is happening or why this is happening, perhaps. But I love you. I thought your theory is really interesting. So let, let's talk about that so everybody can hear where your mind has gone with, you know, again, and I've talked recently on the podcast about how, you know, research is great, but the clinical experience and the things you see clinically can really can, can be in some regards much more insightful at times. And we might not have the data to be like, this is exactly what's happening. Like you said, there's very little research on this. So what is going on with this sebaceous gland? And maybe um, for anybody who doesn't know what a sebaceous gland is, could you just um, give us a little <laughs> up to date on what exactly is that? Fill us in on that and then go into what is going on with it and KP. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we're back in the follicle, right? That's where we started. We said that hair is trying to come up and out. So there's many things happening in the hair follicle besides just the hair growing. We have sweat glands, uh, but we've also got glands called sebaceous glands. And sebaceous glands produce something called sebum. 
uh, sebum I've talked about on uh, the acne podcast with you. Um, so sebum is like an oily substance that's produced down in that gland. Um, sebum is good. Part of what sebum, sebum does is it lubricates that hair follicle shaft so that the hair can come up and out smoothly. And sebum also will come out on the skin and lubricate part of the skin. Now, too much sebum production, overproduction of sebum is bad. That's where we get acne from. Um, but an underproduction of sebum is bad too because you're going to get really dry, flaky, itchy skin. And, uh, you know, potentially that hair is not going to be properly lubricated as it's trying to grow up and out the follicle and then poke out through the skin. There was a fascinating study I found. Now, it's a small study. There was 10 patients. So we say an N of 10, you know, that's not huge, but it's still enough. And they did biopsies from these patients. All 10 patients had keratosis pilaris. They took biopsies from totally clear skin without any KP. And then they took biopsies of the KP spots. And what they found was there was a complete absence of sebaceous glands in the KP areas. On the normal skin, these people had normal skin, normal sebaceous glands. So this is very fascinating. It's not something genetic in them. It's not like, oh, this person can't produce you know, sebum, they don't have sebaceous glands. No, there's something just happening within the follicle. We don't understand why, but I definitely think there's an issue there with a lack of the sebum gumming up those cornea sites as we talked about at the beginning. Now the hair is trying to get through this hair shaft without any extra lubrication. It's dragging gummed up cornea sites and it's getting kind of gummed up at the top and trapped and it, we're getting the, the bump. You know, we wish we knew why don't they have sebaceous glands? How would we put a sebaceous gland back into that follicle? That, you know, we don't have the answer to. I do think it's interesting. So, uh, you know, talking about like, where do we tend to see keratosis pilaris? Far and away, the, locate, the number one location that we'll see it is the back of the arm. And then sometimes it will also kind of creep around onto the front of the arm. That's like over 90% of people are gonna get it in those areas. Um, it can also be like on the top of the thighs, top and side of the thighs. That's uh, the next most common, maybe around 60%. And kind of that the buttocks area, about 30%. You can get it in other places, but it's a lot less likely. What I think is interesting is that different areas of the body have different kind of set levels of sebum production. So think of where do we get acne? We get it on the face, neck, chest, and back. Those are high levels of sebum production. Those are not areas where we tend to see keratosis pilaris, right? Because there's we have kind of high level of sebum production there. The back of the arms and the top of the thighs, we don't get acne there. There's not enough normal sebum production to really get acne there, but that's where we get keratosis pilaris. So I think it's just interesting that areas that are kind of low level sebum production are the areas where we tend to get keratosis pilaris. Something is happening to the, seba the, the sebaceous gland. It's getting compromised. It's shutting down. It's not able to produce the sebum anymore. And again, you know, the big, there's a big question why, uh, but I feel like also a lot of times people are told like, oh, this is just something you have to live with. And that's definitely not true. I treat it, I'm quite successful at treating it. And I think it definitely can be treated. Um, I think it's just, you know, approaching again, the, you know, list of things that we talked about and trying to figure out for that person, what are the pieces that's contributing to the kind of shutdown and, and the KP for them. Yeah, and I also wanted to ask you about the conditions that are sort of cousins or related to KP, because one of which you mentioned, I've had listeners ask about this condition. It's never been mentioned on the show before. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so there's several diseases and conditions that are like related to KP. Well, the non-derm ones, um, obesity, diabetes, and malnutrition. Okay, those aren't healthy states, right? So that tells you like something seems off. So those are like non non-derm diseases related to keratosis pilaris. But for the dermatological complaints, it comes along with eczema. We all know what eczema is. But there's this other disease I think you're referring to called ichthyosis vulgaris. And ichthyosis is Greek for uh, like fish and 
like a fish scale and it's been named ichthyosis vulgaris because it has people have really dry skin and they can get almost like a fish scale kind of look presentation because the skin is so dry and keratosis pilaris is kind of a feature of ichthyosis vulgaris and about 50 percent of people who have ichthyosis vulgaris will go on to develop uh, atopic dermatitis. So these three are very tightly related. I also see a lot of keratosis pilaris in my atopic dermatitis or eczema patients. So these three go along hand in hand, and it kind of comes down to what you were saying at the beginning. It's a very dry skin, and um, there's something called a filaggrin gene. A filaggrin is a protein in skin, and I and others have talked about filaggrin on your podcast many times. A filaggrin is what we call kind of the master regulator of the skin barrier. It's a really important protein in the skin. And with filaggrin, we make something called natural moisturizing factor. The na- I think it's one of the best named proteins in the skin because it tells you what it does. It naturally moisturizes the skin. So if you have a problem like a filaggrin gene mutation and you're not naturally producing a lot of filaggrin, you're not going to be producing a lot of natural moisturizing factor. You're going to be prone to these dry skin diseases like ichthyosis vulgaris, uh, eczema, and keratosis pilaris. So we see this filaggrin gene mutation showing up in some keratosis pilaris patients. And so with the, because I do think it's important, we've talked about fatty acids, and I've had people too who've emailed me and said, I've been doing all of this omega-3 supplements for like the last month or two, and I don't see any improvement. And I thought that this meant that I had an omega-3 fatty acid deficiency, but this, it sounds from what you're saying that this goes far beyond just like just an omega-3 deficiency or just a vitamin D deficiency or something like that, or vitamin A deficiency. There is a kind of a combo of things that you have to consider in order to be really uh, effective and efficient, so to speak. That's absolutely right. And I actually, you know, I think that it's a little more, it's more with the, with the fatty acids than just omega-3. I actually supplement patients with hemp seed oil and flaxseed oil, both oral and topical. Um, they're polyunsaturated fatty acids are a little bit more. They also include like omega-6 fatty acids. So I don't think it's as simple as just oh, just take fish oil if you have keratosis pilaris and it's going to clean up. That's not actually the route that I'm normally taking with patients. And like you said, it's usually a bigger issue. Uh, But like it's linoleic acid, um, alpha linoleic acid. These are other types of essential fatty acids that are different than just like the EPA and DHA that you get from fish oil. So it's, it's bigger than just a fish oil problem. And in terms of some steps in the right direction of like, hey, what could I possibly test out at home? Um, What do you think someone could even just try on their own? You know, because obviously if it is something, I think the message here, this is the takeaway that I'm getting from what you're saying is that this is really, if it bothers you and it's to the point where it is interfering with how your skin feels and whatnot, it may be worthwhile to dig into it because it could be a sign of other underlying problems that may not have become so severe with other symptoms that are bothering you at this point in time. It's sort of like the check engine light is flashing on and it's an opportunity to say, hmm, maybe I should look into this before it becomes like you know, the car needs to go into the shop and will not start. So sort of problem. So um, is there anything that, you know, whether it's, I mean, I, I hate to suggest that just just try your omega three, like you said, it's more than just fish oil. Is there anything else that people could maybe consider on their own, or look at their health in a certain way to help them maybe see things that they didn't see before or consider before that it could be connected to? Yeah, so I would absolutely agree with you. It's definitely the check engine light is flashing and your body is telling you, hey, we're having an abnormal process here because something is wrong. It's not it's not just a cosmetic issue. Um, so yeah, I would agree with you that, you know, finding a health, a licensed healthcare practitioner in your area who's knowledgeable in keratosis pilaris and can kind of help you figure out the pieces 
would be helpful. But for those at home who are really trying to, you know, dig into the pieces themselves, you know, I think starting with things like, are you eating, you know, what are you eating? Are you getting a broad spectrum of nutrients from your food? You know, it's one thing to, to do a multivitamin and multivitamins are fine, but you know, ideally we would also like to be getting it from our food. So are you eating an abundant number of a uh, variety of plants um, and, you know, healthy foods? Um, so checking in on your diet, are you eating a lot of, or, you know, any amount of dairy or gluten? Trying to take them out for, you know, a couple weeks and just see what happens with your skin is an easy thing. Um, I've talked about before, you know, with dairy, there's this whole notion like, oh, don't I need to get calcium from it? The answer is no. If you did, you would still be breastfeeding from your mother. And I think the vast majority of people listening to this podcast are not still breastfeeding from their mother. So getting it from milk is not the way that any mammal has evolved to get calcium once they're beyond infancy. Um, you know, leafy green vegetables, there's lots of good sources of calcium. Um, you know, and gluten, again, is just one of those, unfortunately, inflammatory foods for a lot of people. Um, making sure you're getting healthy seeds and, you know, fats and oils in your diet. You can eat hemp seed. You can eat flax seed. Uh, these are all beautiful additions to a diet, and they're um, rich in fiber as well, and they're anti-inflammatory. So checking in on those kind of lifestyle issues, you know, you're drinking a lot of alcohol. That's super inflammatory and going to potentially cause some nutrient deficiencies. So, you know, it's what we call the fundamentals of health you know, asking yourself, are you doing those kind of basic things, um, you know, with your diet and with your lifestyle, um, or are there things that you could clean up there to reduce inflammation? I do think that that fundamentally helps with keratosis pilaris and, and that overall kind of health of the vehicle, so to speak. Do you think to, um, cause I know like with filagrin, I, we, there's this, I don't think it's a debate at this point, but do you think that the supplementation with L-histidine, the amino acid that makes up, I don't know, it's somewhere between like, I think 11 to 13% of the protein. Do you think that that's possibly helpful in these particular individuals to give a, give a try? Because most of the time it's geared towards folks with eczema. Yeah, I use it. I use it in eczema and I use it in um, keratosis pilaris. And I don't want people going out there and self-dosing with L-histidine. I don't leave patients on it forever. I, I have like a, you know, a starting plan and then we ramp down. Um, but uh, I do think the L-histidine can be helpful. Again, I'm not ever keeping somebody on L-histidine forever, so that's not the answer. If someone has a filagrin gene mutation, they just have a filagrin gene mutation. We don't have the capability right now to change people's genes, so that just is what it is. But again, you know what we say is, you know, genes load the gun, but environment pulls the trigger. So anyone with eczema, anyone with keratosis pilaris, yes, you may have a filagrin gene mutation. Yes, you may be predisposed to getting these conditions, but the environment is going to pull the trigger. You don't need to have eczema and you don't need to have keratosis pilaris as long as you're not pulling the trigger. And that is this kind of, you know, idea of keeping your proverbial bucket from overflowing by, you know, checking in, again, all the lifestyle factors, and then maybe working with a knowledgeable healthcare practitioner who can help you drain that bucket and figure out the pieces that are contributing to, you know, the eczema and potentially KP. Um, and one last quick question, because we didn't, we kind of have touched on it here and there. Any thoughts on the topical, like, scrub it off using these different acids and different things. Is any of that really all that helpful that you have found? Again, it's really symptom suppression, right? Which is, you know, unfortunately, a lot of kind of Western medicine, especially with derm, because we don't really understand what's going on, it is about, you know, well, let's just scrub it off. And, you know, maybe it will make someone's bumps a little bit smoother, but it can irritate the skin to scrub at it like that. So, and it's not really addressing any of the underlying issues. So that's not at all the approach that I take. You know, if, if people find it helpful and it makes them feel more confident to scrub at it, I think as long as they're doing it gently, not actually, you know, aggravating the skin and increasing inflammation, but it's not a path I take because it's just symptom suppression. It's not at all addressing or cleaning up the root cause. Okay. 
That is perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Greenberg. I really appreciate it. I love diving into these conversations with you, especially because the the clinical insights that you bring to the table have been so helpful for all of the listeners. And um, I know that uh, everybody can reach you. There is you have your own your own private practice. And then you also have a training program, which will link up for health professionals, um, anyone who's interested in going into the realm of this whole integrative dermatology space of like how to actually put all the pieces together and figure it out, which is so needed because so many ne- people need help. Um, what is the website, the best website where everyone can find you? Yes. So if someone is a resident of California, Oregon, or Washington, they can go to integrativedermatologycenter.com and um, you can find me there and um, potentially become a patient. Uh, There's also a lot of resources. Um, If you live outside of those states um, and you're looking for, well, If you're a practitioner, uh, like you mentioned, um, and you're looking to become trained in this kind of integrative functional dermatology space, you can head over to Root Cause Dermatology. I have cohorts that run at different times, so you can see if one is coming up or when the next one is. And uh, you have to be a licensed healthcare professional to be accepted into the training program. Uh, But then I train all about this, how to treat keratosis proaris this way, eczema, psoriasis, all sorts of conditions. And then if you're a patient or if you're a a person who has keratosis proaris and you're looking for somebody who I've trained, that would also be on rootcausedermatology.com. You'll go to the find a practitioner link and all the uh, graduates of the root cause dermatology dermatology course, the professionals will be listed on there. And then hopefully you can find someone in your area who's trained in this, who I've trained, who can help uh, treat your underlying root cause of your keratosis pilaris. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And I look forward to having you back the next time. Yes. Thanks so much, Jennifer. If you enjoyed this video, you need to tune in to this video next, then make sure to hit the subscribe button so you get notified as soon as a new episode drops. I'm excited to see you there and dive deeper with you on your skin healing journey.